All right, gonna give it a, another few minutes for people to arrive. And then I'm gonna hand over to, to Snail to talk us through Synergy in Motion. Of course, uh, we couldn't run this meetup without our sponsors. Butter, the tool you're using right now, is, is one of our sponsors. They're a great product. You will see that if you've never used it before, uh, do check it out. I've got a, a discount code you can use to give that a try. And also Agile Testing Day is the conference in Germany that I went to last year. I'm keynoting at this year is also a sponsor of ours. They help us run and afford the tech that goes into these community events. Right, folks. Well, I am particularly looking forward to this session today for a couple of reasons. One, I'm an absolute geek when it comes to AI. And two, I've met Snail a couple of times at, uh, at conferences. What was it? Was it in US and Amsterdam, right? And on both occasions, annoyingly, our sessions were clashing. We were speaking at the same time. So we've never actually been able to see a live session. So I'm very fortunate to be able to do so today. And I'm gonna hand, I'm pretty much gonna hand it over to, to Snail from there. He is Mr. Agile AI, very people-centric approach to AI. And I'm sure there's gonna be lots of lessons, lots of learnings, lots of cool things that you're gonna pick up in the session today. He does have some time built in or a, a portion built in for Q&A. Uh, so there'll be a slide for that. But if you do have any questions, just drop them into the chat as well. I'm sure we can pick up on those. And let's do this. Over to you, my friends. Awesome. Share your screen. Thank you so much, Chris, uh, for having me today. Uh, let me just make sure that you guys can see my screen here. All right. I can't see you guys, but uh, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. So thanks, Chris. Uh, for the warm invite, uh, first time on, I uh, love this platform, and I also love the, the meetup. So welcome everyone to AI and Agile Frontiers. Um, I'm really excited about this talk for multiple reasons, but before we get started, I want to ask you, what are you most excited to learn about today? So to join this poll, all you have to do is scan the QR code um, or join slido.com and enter that code in, and you should be able to just answer that question right away. Let me know if you run into any difficulties. AI and agile innovative ideas, human side of AI. Will AI take our jobs? Number one question I get, and no, I'll, say, I'll, I'll answer that preemptively and say it's not going to take our jobs. Any business driven usages, which tool can be used as a low hanging fruit in 2024? with the data ownership respected, the best prompts to use, make AI useful for everyday life, just to learn, fantastic. Awesome, thank you so much for participating in this poll. The next question I have is what AI have you used? So any kind of AI that you used in the past months, years, And I love this question, and I'll tell you guys in a little bit just why I love this question. So I'll start telling the story about this question. I've been asking this question around the world. Last year, I did 14 talks around the world. Um, and it, it is just a question that always makes me wonder is like, if I asked this question maybe three years back, what would have been the response? But if I had to predict, I think the next, the answer would be ChatGPT uh, is what mostly everyone puts. And that's exactly uh, the case here. Um, it's, I, I find this very, very um, interesting because uh, ChatGPT is not the only, it's just you know known as generative AI and we'll talk about what generative AI is, but really ChatGPT put AI on the map um, and Mostly everyone besides the AI community, uh, everyone knows that that is basically uh, the November 2022 was the moment um, where it, AI became accessible to everyone. Um, and since then, everything has just amplified. Um, the amount, the pace of change uh, has gone exponential. And we'll talk about how that change has affected 
um, the industry uh, all across every industry all across the board. So I love that some folks have put Notion, um, Miro. So a lot of the everyday tools have started to use uh, AI, um, and we're going to see a lot more of it. And and, and to be honest with you, this is just the beginning. Uh, we're just scratching the surface when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, what we're seeing. So I want to play this video and hopefully you guys can hear it. Uh, but for, this is from Davos, uh, from uh, Dr. Andrew Ying. If you haven't heard of Dr. Andrew Ying, he's a, he's a great person to follow. Uh, he's from deeplearning.ai. But let's play this video for a uh, No, I, I can't hear the audio. Maybe it's just me. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to fix that. Um, Same for me. So now, if you've got the link to it, I can very quickly add a, a, a video embedded into the tool. Um, you can yeah. feel free to kind of come back to that and we'll yeah, we'll let's go back and come back to that. But if you've, yeah, if you've got the link, I can put in. Yeah, I, I can. Uh, Actually, here I can just share this thing. Go back to the meetup and have a uh, chat box right here. Here you go, Chris. Perfect. I'll have it on the way. Awesome. So I'm going to go back to to my slides here, and we'll come back to that video. But that video, video what it actually is saying is. Um, Andrew Ying's partner, who founded co-founder of Coursera, Coursera, you know, mentioned that we we need to teach people structured thinking. And really, what got me when when she mentioned that at Davos, and really, you know, agile is all about structured thinking. Um, and I, I draw those parallels because, you know, by definition, structured thinking is just a methodological like way of organizing and problem solving to make decision making easier. And the way we do that is this you know, taking complex issues and breaking it into smaller chunks, uh, into manageable parts. And if you look at what Agile has done, it's basically emphasizing that flexibility, collaboration, and iterative development, doing the same thing. Um, and it allows us, uh, you know, in the Agile community to kind of, you know, we've been doing this thing forever. And I think that the two parallels, even though we may call it different things, terminology may be different. I think the, you know, the, the understanding of what structured thinking and agile, I think there's so many similarities, right? Uh, both promote systemic, systematic and organized approach of problem solving. And this is going to be very, very important uh, as we go in this journey uh, is really understanding both uh, from an agile standpoint and also from an AI standpoint, understanding what structured thinking is uh, because it's, it's a skill set. It's not something that everyone can do um, you know, it takes some time to build. And I, I always liked, I was kind of intrigued to see someone at Davos talking about structured thinking and how that kind of comes to comes together. So with that, I'm going to talk about AI in the news. Uh, I started doing this um, slide throughout my talks and I got tired of putting snippets. So I found these charts and these charts basically are AI news that were revealed uh, and this is basically in one week. So I used to do this, put snippets of like news that came in the first, I, I remember, uh, you know, very vaguely, like the first uh, talk that I gave, uh, this was actually just a little bit before ChatGPT was released. And I was just giving snippets of like news that were coming and, you know, yes, it was, but it got crazy uh, in that, you know, just like, once we hit November 2022, and then we started going three to four months in, it just got it just got crazy. Uh, it, you know, everyone in the AI space, there's news every single day, and this is basically in a span of one week. So if you think about the innovation that's happening, it's happening all within just a span of one week. Every day, I mean, I was intrigued that even at times, like every hour, I was hearing something being released. So just to give you an example. This happened in one week. Like, uh, we had a breakthrough in image generation. We had Copilot's first Android prompt techniques to skyrocket Claude's accuracy. 
uh, Apple's open source ML framework for Mac was released. Google unveiled Gemini. So there's this race, um, you know, and every company you're seeing it today, uh, everyone's dancing. And I actually, I, I, I quote Satya Nadella. He said, I'm going to make Google dance this year. Um, and I feel like everyone is dancing and a 2024 year is, is that year of the dance. Um, you know, I think every company, uh, is really trying and pushing the innovation, uh, limits to, to something that I've never witnessed. Um, and I don't think anyone will have witnessed, uh, based off of what's coming, but some highlights that I like to give is that a new study on coding behavior raises questions about impact of AI software development. Uh, that was kind of, you know, beginning of this year, uh, people started to see, hey, AI is good, but, you know, we still need to have a human in the loop to make sure that the quality of the code stay, stays relevant. Uh, and that's that can change, right? It's, it's an understanding of how do we, um, you know, make sure that we as humans um, are in the loop, but at the same time, understand and be open-minded that AI will get better, you know, over time. I think that's the biggest thing that we don't realize is that we just don't give it enough time. Stability AI releases stable code for, you know, again, coding use case has gone off the charts. But another thing that I've started to see is OpenAI signs up its first higher education customer that was in the beginning of this year. Uh, so education um, partnership with OpenAI, that was a huge one bringing generative AI into the education and learning space. I always question if, if education, you know, in, in certain institutions can bring AI into their space, we should be able to bring AI into our space to educate others and, and really uh, teach them a lot of different things that we do in, on our day-to-day -day agile, uh, you know, agile activities that we conduct. Oracle embeds generative AI across the technology stack to enable the, the AI adoption at scale. Um, you know, people are saying that the 2024 will be the year of the AI assistant. And I'll talk a little bit about AI agents and what that means. Um, Harvard is using ChatGPT to teach computer science, um, which is amazing. So Harvard took ChatGPT, customized it, so it doesn't give answers to the students, but instead it gives them questions uh, and it really guides them through the answer, guides them. So instead of just saying, hey, give me the answer to this solution, you know, this problem, it will actually walk you through and actually prompt you back to make you think. Uh, so Harvard has done something phenomenal in that, um, in that area. Today, this is latest breaking news today. Um, Gemini just announced uh, Gemini 1.5 coming uh, to consumer. Um, and what's really important on this news is that what shocked me is that they tested something and they said, we are able to do 10 million. Uh, so the token size, the context size window is about 10 million tokens. And I just posted this a couple of uh, minutes ago is that if you think about, and I'll talk about token size, many of you may not be aware of what token size is, but token size is just the context you can send this large language model to be able to get that response. And if you're talking, if you're talking about up until today, I think the largest token size was about 200,000 tokens. Uh, so just think about 10 million and 10 million is equivalent to maybe like, you know, 600 hours of just talking and conversation that you can send as context to then be able. And this is just in a span of, I would say like, you know, two years, like, like we're hearing this, right? I mean, we're, we've gone from a context size window of maybe like, you know, 2,000 to 3,000 the generative AI space to now like 10 million. So if you think about the time, time is very exponential in this case. Uh, this is a new one too. Huawei, Huawei researchers uh, say giving AI um, a body is the next step towards human level agents. So really allowing AI to understand action, memory, and experience. And I'll talk about what companies are doing to really understand that piece and how that comes together. So, so far, in the generative AI space, we've only seen language. We've seen a majority of the use cases be text. Uh, there are some multi-modality uh, pieces that we've seen, but um, this will be interesting to see large action models and, and what that means uh, in that aspect. And then obviously OpenAI this year has said that they are going to release something that's uh, related to AI agents uh, soon 
in in the whole uh, you know OpenAI ChatGPT kind of ecosystem, uh, which will allow us to operate day-to-day uh, -day tasks um, and automate those tasks. And I'll give you an example of how that can be automated. Another thing that is um, quite uh, interesting is AI wearables. Um, these are all devices that uh, I have coming uh, soon. Notice that there's no Apple Vision Pro here because that's part of spatial computing. And I'm, not going to, I'm not talking about that here today, but these are AI wearable devices that are being launched this year. Uh, on this side, you see the Humane Pin, uh, which is again, a, a device that uses AI to be able to, you'll be, you know, it, it's able to see, it's able to um, uh, kind of deduce a lot of information that's, uh, that's around you. Uh, here you see a, a, a rewind tablet. So basically you wear this uh, uh, rewind pendant, sorry, uh, and it kind of records your day-to-day -day activities and you can go back and technically go back in time and ask because it's generated with AI. It's taking that context and being able to go back. On the right-hand side, you see Rabbit R1 device, which is another uh, device that was showcased at CES this year that also uses AI. It's a, it's, um, it is based off of what we call large action models. So today we have large language models predicated on language, uh, but the large action models allows you to automate actions uh, and you can teach it. So just like if I'm, let's say, uh, example in our space would be if I teach Rabbit, uh, hey, how do I put this ticket into JIRA once, then it can learn over time. And then all you have to do is ask Rabbit, hey, Rabbit, can you put this ticket into JIRA? It'll follow the same steps and the actions that were done. So it actually learns the action from end to end. And then on here, this is from Brilliant Labs. Uh, these are multimodal AI glasses. Um, and this is the first, I think, consumer product. This, this product here and this product here are both made, founders are former Apple uh, executives. Um, but the, the frames are kind of, I think, the first one where you will see in-screen print with AI. So like you can be looking at something and ask, hey, you know, what am I looking at? And it can give you some context or you can ask it in search like really basic questions and real-time translation is also available uh, through these glasses. And the key thing that I'm really excited about for these brilliant lab glasses is it's the first open source glass. So you will be able to um, kind of do a lot of things in that area. So when I talk about AI agents, um, you know, an example here is this was something that I found online this morning is someone giving a picture of a flooded basement. So I want you to you know, kind of think about where we're headed is we're headed to something called AI agents. And I know I'm, I'm, making, I'm jumping here, uh, but I, I, the reason I wanted to talk about this is because A, I wanna make sure we talk about the latest and greatest. But AI agents is basically something that uh, is able to automate end-to-end -end actions. Um, and we're seeing that being applied in a lot of the applications that are being developed today. Uh, so one of the things that you see here is this is an image that is completely flooded and someone was just like, I'm going to create an app where you get a notification if something is going to cause some damage to your basement. But the interesting thing is, think about this. We, GPT-4 Vision can do this today. Tomorrow, when, when OpenAI announces their agent framework, you will be able to take this end-to-end -end action and say, hey, take a picture from your camera and be able to upload that every, let's say 15 minutes. And then if there's anything that looks different because it has that contextual awareness, you know, be able to send you a message saying that this, you need to go check your basement because it's about to, you know. So my key thing here is to really help you think where we're headed. So right now we're in that space where this is static. Like you just upload a picture and ask it, hey, you're you're in charge of making sure this has, has nothing bad to happen in it. Um, you know, and you watch webcams for signs of issues. Is there anything to worry about, right? So this is a one-time deal. But when you think about agent framework, I want you to think about automating this and doing this multiple times without you having to be there. So that is something I think is it is automation and it's the agent of framework that will allow us to do a lot of the things that we don't want to do and still have insights 
on on things and i'll 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 kind of relate this to a um a agile scenario and uh, and show you kind of what's possible so us tech adoption uh this is kind of like where the you know where my talk actually begins those are some of the slides i just put in uh just before this talk but day one when the internet smartphones came we still had you know the projection wasn't wasn't a hockey stick projection ai on the other hand november 2022 ai has just literally this curve is it's, it's just straight up it hasn't um you know it hasn't moved at the same time ai is surpassing human parity uh, you know ai is getting better faster and i think this is the slide that i spend a, a little bit of time because i want people to recognize that you know there are so many things that AI can do better than us, but there are so many things that AI can't do better than us. There are, you know, and that's what we need to find. We need to figure out what are the things that we're good at from a human perspective and what are some good things that, you know, what are we good at from, you know, what is AI good at uh, in terms of AI's perspective? And what you see here is basically in all areas, image recognition, um, code generation is again, uh, really a popular one. Um, language understanding, reading comprehension. I mean, you've seen all the use cases up until this point, but AI really can do a lot of that better than we can. And I'd like to start the slide off by saying, avoid the Turing trap. So how many of you here have um, uh, know about the Turing test? I'm gonna go back so I can see you guys. Uh, see here. So. Anyone heard of the Turing test? Okay, it seems like some, 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 thumb, some thumbs up happening, some people nodding, some people shaking their heads. Okay, all right. Thanks, Chris, for that. So let me tell you about the Turing test. So Turing test was created by Alan Turing in the 50s. And basically, it was a test to, to really uh, correlate the machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to a human. So it was the only test available at that time to really assess humans and machines and the intelligence between, you know, that's how we kind of, uh, you know, if, if you pass the Turing test, then we, you know, we said that, okay, passing the test means that the machine is perceived and having human level intelligence. But I think this is where, and I, uh, the picture I have is Dr. Eric Beneficent from Stanford. Uh, and I, I had a conversation with him uh, in, in one of the conferences that I, that I went to um, and it is interesting, and I do recommend this book uh, by him. It's called Machine Platform Crowd, Harnessing Our Digital Future. And he, he wrote this book uh, way before any of the generative AI space kind of blew up. But one thing he says is, you know, we want to avoid the Turing trap because judging an AI system solely based on its ability to mimic humans is what makes us, that, that fear mongling comes, concept comes into our mind. Uh, because we think that AI is going to take over uh, because we're comparing AI to human intelligence. But if you just say, you know, if you just think of machines as having machine intelligence, right, then, and if you avoid this Turing trap, then it, it you know, it becomes a less, less burden of saying, oh, that fear mongling kind of stops. So again, why is this pro problematic is because it focuses on too much of the human likeness than the usefulness, right? And so we need to really move away from that. Uh, risk of overestimating system capabilities based on a limited test, and it distracts from developing AI that is ethical, aligned with uh, human values, and, you know, benefits society. So really, we want to avoid it. We want to avoid it so we, you know, understand that it, there are certain things that AI can do better than us and accept that, right? Uh, be, and, and not compare it to human intelligence because I, I definitely think that machine intelligence and human intelligence are two separate mediums and I'm with him. Uh, you know, the Turing trap kind of makes us fall into that uh, because we're associating human intelligence with machine intelligence. So anyways, how does this, how does the evolution of AI kind of evolve, right? So we have basically, um, the Turing machine and what Alan Turing kind of generated that test from was uh, what we call advanced neural networks. But 1950s, the Turing test was created uh, again to 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 really test intelligence in artificial systems. But in the 80s, we had expert systems. In the 2000s, we had machine learning. And today, 
uh, in 2010 and today, we we're talking about deep learning and neural networks. And I'll talk about kind of how that uh, progresses and what that means. But the current state is that AI is now part of everything that we do. And it's becoming part of everything we do from recommendation systems to generative AI, to autonomous vehicles, name it, AI is everywhere. You know, right now, as, as you speak and you're on this computer uh, listening, uh, I'm sure if you have any smart devices, um, there is, you know, there's AI, some form of AI that's baked into that. Maybe it's not generative AI, maybe it's a machine learning algorithm that's, that's sitting behind. So this brings me up to what is artificial intelligence? So the definition of AI, it refers to the simulation of, you know, human intelligence in machines, enabling them to perform tasks that require human intelligence. Uh, there's three types of AI, well, narrow AI, which is specialized in one ta task, which I just mentioned, voice assistance. So if you have Alexa or, you know, Echo, um, that's all predicated on narrow AI. Now, uh, that being said, I think Amazon is trying to make Alexa a lot more smarter. So they're actually now going beyond that. But general AI is basically intelligence comparable to human abilities. And then super intelligence AI is basically you know, artificial super intelligence is also another term. It's surpassing human intelligence. And so the core concepts when it comes to AI, it's machine learning, neural networks, deep learning, and natural language processing. Now there's, there's so much in the AI space. Um, it's not just generative AI, it's not just chat GPT. Uh, there are many problems that can be solved without actually using generative AI. Um, but, uh, you know, I just want to make sure that everyone here kind of understands that. So this brings up to us to the topic of discussion. How does AI and Agile work together? Um, AI and Agile are basically, to me, uh, kind of, it's it's similar um, in the context of what I think the future will hold is we, we, where I'm seeing it right now, we have AI powered teams. Um, you know, you have a product owner, you have a scrum master, you have a dev team member, and you have an agile coach, uh, but you also have an AI team, an AI team of AI coding assistants. You have AI learning facilitators, AI data analysts, AI learning, like AI learning educators, um, all within their, their own team. And what's going to happen is today we're working together in some construct with the human in the loop. But at some point, when we talk about the agent framework, this team can sit on its own. And that is something we haven't gotten there, we're, but we're hitting the barriers. This, this, this team right now is like off coming to in its own circle at some point. But today we call that AI Agile Copilots. And I wanna ask the, the folks here, how many of you guys have already started using Copilots at work or within your context of work? And Copilot, I mean, ChatGPT, anything, Microsoft Copilot, any of that. Like how many of you guys have started using Copilot? Miro, if you're using Miro, I know Miro has a Copilot. So look at that, thumbs up across the board. Everyone is using a Copilot. But now think about in in just a, in you know in just a moments of time. Like time here is like I say six months is about ten years in this AI space, right? So just within the next six months, you'll see completely different architecture and how people start using it. Like I, I truly believe in the next maybe six to seven months, uh, towards the end of this year, for sure, we will start seeing, if not sooner, we'll start seeing this team kind of do things on its own. So today you're using it as a co-pilot, great. But tomorrow you will be able to tell your, delegate that task to your co-pilot team and say, you know, here's, here's the thing. But notice when I said delegation, up until now, we always felt delegation was something frowned upon when we try to delegate tasks to people. But now, when, if we go into the agent of framework, we're, we as humans are going to have to learn how to delegate to agents. And that's a skill set too. Because not every, every, you know, how many of you guys have tried to ask AI what you want and, and haven't gotten any success in terms of what you're looking for? Um, just curious. Thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> Or is it that if you ask AI, you get your answer 100% every single time? All right, thumbs down. So, so that's so that's um, that's really important to understand is that you know you you have co-pilots today, but 
tomorrow it will be um, agents. So here's the AI team. Um, for coding assistance, there are many coding assistants there uh, that are available for you to, to see uh, and use uh, today. GitHub Copilot being, I think, the top one um, that we use. Uh, there's AI learning facilitators. There's uh, what we call Agile GPT. If anyone's interested, we created uh, Agile GPT. We're rebranding it. I'm more than happy to share if anyone's interested in testing that beta. Inflection.ai. Meta AI chatbots, ChatGPT, Spinach.io is a one that I'm really um, a fond of because I can help. I can show you a use case in the agile sense, kind of how that can help. Um, any of the Fireflies.ai, Otter.ai, and there's so many. Uh, there's an AI for that.com. There's a website. There's tools for so many AI tools. But really, I, I kind of cherry pick these for our agile use case and kind of show. Right, what can be done. So rethinking agile principles in the age of AI. So recent advances in AI are transforming software development and the way we work. We need to re-examine, in my opinion, the value, agile values and principles in light of these new emerging technologies. So today we're at the AI space. Tomorrow we'll be at the spatial, you know, spatial computing XR space. How do we adopt? How do we really stay ahead of the curve and, and really understand? And it's, it's an exciting time to reimagine delivering more value faster with smarter teams and tools, right? So if you have an AI team, you have, um, you know, all of these things at your disposal, how do you kind of bring that together um, and really deliver the value that your customer is looking for? So the future of human and AI dynamics. This picture is actually taken from an open AI paper. Um, and basically what this is showing is this is a paper on super alignment. Um, and it, not to go into the intricate details, but this was actually a, a paper, uh, first author was Ilya Sutskever. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Ilya Sutskever, but he's the one that uh, stirred the drama in OpenAI, rumors are. Uh, but you know, I've gotten a chance to listen to him speak. And one of the things he, he mentioned, he's the brainchild behind OpenAI, by the way very smart intellect person. Uh, but in this paper, what he mentions is that, you know, traditional, you know, reinforcement learning by human feedback, that's what ChatGPT is based off of, right? Like we are prompting ChatGPT, it learns from our feedback. Uh, you know, if you've seen the thumbs up and thumbs down on the ChatGPT prompts or any um, co-pilot you've used, you're really training the model to, to refine its answers, right? And it's, it's through human feedback. Um, but what he's saying is that today, that's the case. When it comes to uh, super alignment, though, there will be a point where, you know, the intelligence will surpass the human level. So at that point, we won't be able to train uh, the, the AI in that aspect. This, if the student is AI, we won't be able to train and surpass that, right? So what he's proposing is that have AI train AI. Uh, and have that scaffold uh, be there. So it's like kind of like if I were to give you an example, it's like when you're teaching a child how to ride a bicycle, you're not really telling the child exactly how to pedal that bike, right? You're there as a scaffold to help them so they don't fall or they don't tip over. Um, similarly, this is the future of like if we were to serve, if we were to keep going at this pace, that we will need AI to train AI. Um, yeah, and, and it's just, a, a, again, this is, again, avoid, avoiding the Turing trap uh, because we recognize that we, we are only able to train at, at some level, and then after that level, we need some kind of view. So this is a great paper. If anyone's interested, I'm more than happy to share, but the future of human and AI dynamics, I think, will be critical uh, in understanding AI. Some AI agility principles, um, you know, adaptability, augmentation data-driven transparency and ethics, right? These are five areas that I think are really important uh, when it comes to putting AI and Agile together. AI Agile practices. So what do you do? How do I put this into practice? You might be asking as an Agilist. Identify, analyze where AI could actually provide value. 
Uh, selecting the AI models, so research and choose appropriate AI. Educate yourself first on what models and tools are available for AI that's out there. Um, and then ideate, use AI to broaden the solution exploration place. Plan, so you know, incorporate your AI insights for a longer term vision. Um, and then be able to create high quality work faster with AI. Today, we're still in that co-pilot mode, right? But with human AI, I think there are so many use cases are in our piece that we can do high quality work much faster with that augmentation. And then just enable that experimentation and feedback loop even faster, right? Make it, make it quick, make it rapid, and then track that AI impact over time. So in order for us to do this, we have to understand AI. And that's where I think the new AI agile coach role is headed, is really fusing the adoption of understanding AI and understanding agility and bringing those two things together. Because I think the new AI Agile Coach will help guide teams on leveraging AI to increase speed, quality, and innovation. We'll understand how to assess these AI opportunities. We'll advise on ethical AI principles and hold teams accountable of understanding that. Coaching the integration of AI into Agile practices because Think about it. Would you want your teams to use any kind of AI uh, that's not vetted in your enterprise into an agile practice? Probably not. Facilitates experimentation with AI, monitors AI solutions for transparency drift, um, shapes the future vision of AI assisted agile teams. And I, I have a book actually coming out in a couple of months called AI powered teams. And in that book, I talk about uh, AI assisted agile teams and also what happens when we have a full autonomous AI team. Uh, that is, that are doing some of the tasks that we don't like to do. Um, so the AI Agile coach role, in my opinion, is going to be imperative to shape the future vision of AI assisted Agile teams. Um, you know, that, you know, something will have to happen when it comes to uh, understanding the dynamics between machine and humans. Um, and I think we will play, if we can upskill ourselves to understand AI, uh, it, at, at that level, we'll be able to better accommodate for the teams of the future. This brings me to ethical and responsible AI, a key ingredient, um, and it's really important to make sure that we understand that AI is developed and used transparently across, you know, all, uh, you know, all basically all cultures everywhere we go. Every every geographical region has their policies. But it's really important to understand transparency, so explainable systems, accountability, mechanisms to hold even AI accountable, um, avoid bias, ensure fairness in the training data, respecting user privacy and data rights. I think that's a number one thing uh, that we're not doing a good job here in the States on. Um, technical limitations and regulatory gaps hinder full adoption of principles. And then, you know, this is something that really needs a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of talk happening but I think it needs to be more actionable. Uh, and I know the community is working very, very diligently in, in a lot of the countries. I think EU is doing a great job in this area um, in terms of understanding the guardrails uh, for ethical and responsible AI. Data privacy and ownership with AI. So for those of you who are using AI, these are key things that you should consider. Um, you know, Understand that a lot of these models that you're using, they don't own your data, but some of them may be using your data to train their models. There are ways to kind of turn that off. I know OpenAI ChatGPT allows you to turn that feature off. But if you're ever concerned about your privacy safeguards and data ownership rights, reach out to the folks that you're, the tool or anyone that you're working with and ask these questions, right? Any tool that I use, the first question I ask is, what is your underlying foundational model that you're using? Uh, based off of that question alone, you can get a lot of clarity. If they're saying that they're using any closed source models, then you know that you have to be vigilant on what you're sharing uh, because you know there could be ex data that can be exposed. Um, and so you have to really understand and take a deeper dive. Like, hey, is it, even if you're using the cloud format, what is the uh, you know, what are some underlying data or security protocols that are being taken place? So ask these questions. If you're ever concerned about security, data, and ownership, these are powerful questions, I think, that need to be asked. So talking about AI tasks and human tasks, right? There's automated code generation for AI, predictive analytics, automated testing in QA, and then human tasks, 
where I think we, you know, empathetic leadership, strategic planning, stakeholder communication, and then creative problem solving, right? These are four areas, many more areas I think humans have uh, really good insight in. One of the things I'll say is strategic planning, because when you do strategic planning, you're te technically making a gamble, right? You're trying to figure out, okay, where am I going to strategically place? And I don't think AI can tell you that. AI can give you the insights to that, but AI can't tell you where do you want to put your money in or where do you want to put your uh, value in? So there, there are many more. I mean, this is just an extrapolation, but I think you can, one uh, activity that I have folks do in an organization is write down every task that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Start simple. Just write down every single thing that you do. And then from that, once you have a good list of all the tasks that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, ask yourself, what can AI do better in, in that list? And then also write down what you can do better. So then you will have this kind of complementary roles list of seeing. And then whenever you, once you've identified all the AI tasks, then you can kind of see, okay, how can I start delegating this, right? Because there's a skill set in delegating those tasks and getting those results and putting that back into your flow system. So I talked about, um, all of those things, I think my slides were kind of mishmash, but overview of AI, this is what companies think AI looks like, that there's some data, there's some AI, and then there's some value that's generated. But really what's under the hood is this, it's very complex. Um, all of what you're seeing is not easy. Uh, I mean, yeah, it seems simple that we just use ChatGPT and we get the data. But if you look at what's underlying in these, uh, in these systems, you have data that's being selected, sourced, and synthesized. Um, you, you probably hear this a lot when it comes to training models. Um, you have the data engineering component, you have the model component, uh, and on the value side, you also have, you know, the registration, the deployment and the monitoring, the retraining of those models. Uh, obviously all of this has constraints kind of hooked by legal, ethical transparency, historical bias and security. So as you see, it's not as simple as that. It, there is a lot of, uh, and every single one of these, I think. NVIDIA CEO just said this, uh, I think in Dubai, he said, in your organization, you don't want an AI all-rounder. You want to have a, a vertical for every you know, AI expert at each point of the system. So if you look at this, every vertical should have AI expertise in it. Uh, you can't have one person doing all of this. It's just no way. Um, so again, this is a little bit technical, but I like to share the complexity of of what that AI looks like. So learning from data, pattern recognition and decision-making, that's basically the practical AI understanding the basics. Uh, that's what ChatGPT is doing too. It's just taking, you have large amounts of data in language uh, being used and that's basically what we're doing. Like I said, foundational AI concepts, you have AI as the large umbrella machine learning and deep learning. And within this bubble, we have one dot, which is the generative AI dot. So I'm not gonna go over all of this. Um, I know I might be, how am I doing on time, Chris? I mean, you're doing okay. We've, uh, we'll probably finish about six-ish. You got 13 minutes. We wanna include a bit of time for, for Q and A. Yeah. So I'm gonna go through some of this. I mean, these are some of the things, the workshop slides I think that are in here, but I'm gonna go over um, the, the concepts of how ChatGPT works and how you can use it uh, to help, it, help you in your day-to-day. -day. So if you understand this, you'll understand how it works and you'll be able to ask it better questions. The whole predication of how um, you know, this concept works is basically, like I said, generative AI falls in this deep learning bubble, but it is, uh, ChatGPT is kind of based off of this artificial neural networks, and it's actually mimicking how our brain works. Um, and so if you think about it, um, there, there is basically you know, how our brains work. So we fire neurons, our neurons get emitted signals, they travel through these dendrites and axons, and we, uh, you know, we're able to kind of say what we say and do what we do. Similarly, there's artificial neural networks where the neuron in this case is a node and each node has an input layer which receives data, um, the hidden layer which processes the data 
and then the output layer. And an example I'll show is, uh, actually, I'm going to jump um, an example to show you uh, as an activity. But think of it like this. When I say the sky is, right, so this is an artificial neural network, forward propagation network. But when I say the sky is, what's the immediate next word that comes into your mind? Someone can blurt it out. What's the next word? If I say the sky is dark and full of terrors. Yeah, so Chris is an exception there. So I'm going to have to adjust my weight on my network to go to that. But the majority of the folks here would say what? Blue. Blue, right? And that's because we have this training that we've seen this context over and over again. Um, and so some, many people ask me, and I get this, the sky is falling or, the, or a different answer like Chris said. And what happens is these models are trained on vast amounts of data. And you'll hear this, hey, can we adjust the weights on the, on the model? And when they say adjust weights, all they're saying is, you know, can we change the prediction so it can go somewhere else? And that's why it's important to understand how these underlying models are trained because everything is still generated on data. And if I wanted my answer to say gray, I would have to you know, retrain my models and adjust the weights um, to kind of be able to propagate in that, in that direction. Um, so that's the concept. I mean, I, I kind of give it uh, another, another way to think of this is music. If you've, if you've ever played an instrument, that first time you played it, you're probably horrible, right? But over time, you build these neural pathways and they get stronger with training data because you're listening, you're writing, you're, you're, you know, uh, you're playing. All of these are modalities that you're, this is contextual information that your brain is receiving. And over time, when you do that over and over and over again, right, that signal gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And at that point, you'll be able to play Mozart's piece on the piano or, you know, whatever the case may be. But that's basically how ChatGPT and all of these generative AI models work in a nutshell, is they're predicated off of this artificial neural network. And all they're doing in that aspect is predicting that next word, but they're predicting it with context, right? So there's a difference. It's not just predicting the next word with predictability, it's like context. Um, so it's important to note that I do have an activity if you guys um, are, if you have enough time, I can show, kind of put this in context. So here I'm going to do a really quick um, image. Uh, so you guys can see my screen, right? Yeah. Yep. We can see. All right. I think awesome. So what what's happening here is I'm I'm holding a remote. Um, actually, I'm going to hold it here. So I'm holding a remote. And I'm going to train my. This is this is a mock-up of a what artificial neural neural network and how it's trained. So here I'm training this remote on basically let's say 190 images, and we'll call that remote. So this is how we train a model, and this is just a depiction of that. And I have this uh, mini bear gram, so I'm going to train this as. Uh, um, we're going to train that. And we'll do the same thing around 90 images. So I'm, this is my training data, right? I'm training my model here. And what happens is when I train this model, this is the, can, can someone tell me what this looks like based off what we discussed? This is basically our input layer, hidden layer, and this is going to be our output layer. So now I've successfully trained a model. So if I look at this and I show it the remote, it should say 100% remote. But if I if I show it to get, if I show okay now if I show the Teddy grams it should say it's hundred percent grams but what happens if I show both of them right it starts getting confused it's like I don't know which one it is because I didn't have this in my training data set so it doesn't know that I can have these two things together right so the same way AI has to be trained on all like there's tons and tons of data points that everything especially if you're autonomous vehicle, if you're Tesla's, right? Tesla's taking data and point to point. So it's really important to understand that it takes vast amounts of data to train a model. Um, and this is a good way to kind of educate folks on, on the back end of what's happening. Um, so I'm gonna kind of quickly go through this. Generative AI is again, the bubble, what we've all seen. 
Um, you guys have all used ChatGPT. Here are some other large language models that are in the market besides ChatGPT. BARD is now Gemini. Uh, so that has changed. Meta AI, Falcon LLM, these are open source. Mistral is another open source um, model. Use cases, plenty. Um, and with the time that I have, I just want to showcase some some tools that you can, you know, that you can use right away. Spinach.io, you can call this to your meetings. Um, and I guess I didn't get to call it into this meeting, but I'll show you if you call, all you have to do is invite Spinach to your meetings. So, so if you're having a retrospective or a daily standup, um, you can call that. And I today I had a, a software delivery thing. So here, what Spinach does, it listens to everything that you said, say, and then kind of give you a summary of what was discussed. Uh, in the meeting, also talk gives you the blockers, you know, celebrations, key decisions, action items. And what you can do is you can change your key, you know, action items and create tickets to go to your ALM tool of which, whichever tool. So you don't have to do these tasks, right? So if I hit this create ticket, it's going to go straight to my Trello board and pop up will open up a ticket and, you know, there I have it, right? So, um, it's 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 this is what gets us to that maximum efficiency in the agile space. Do we really want to spend time creating tickets, or do we really want to focus on the conversation? And if I'm not in an asynchronous world, do I want to get insights pretty quickly to see what happened during the meeting? Uh, Spinach also actually records the entire video, so if you didn't download or if you didn't hit, forgot to hit record, as long as Spinach is there, Spinach will kind of uh, bring. So that's a really good tool in the AI agile space. Um, especially connecting with other ALM tools that you might have. Um, another one that I like to uh, show is, uh, I know Chris, you might be, um, you might know this one, the Drawify tool, uh, which is which is good for for Agilists as well. Um, so you can create images for presentations. Um, so if you if you're interested in creating graphics, uh, you know you can uh, kind of create graphics from here. You can use their Ask Maya assistant. Another tool I will share is Jetta.ai. Uh, it is kind of like Mural, but um, a, a little different in terms of how. Uh, but it's a collaboration whiteboard space. Um, it's kind of. Uh, So it, it's just like Mural, but you can it's AI baked with everything. Um, you can ask it to create a SWOT analysis board, anything. Like, let's just say a, create a sprint retrospective board. I'm going really fast, so apologize. I'm trying to get to the questions, but I want to showcase a little bit of the things that you can do in that. So here's a very simple. But this is like lifetime collaboration. People can come in here and just do like just like mural, and you can have infinite um, kind of AI requests. Uh, you can say, uh, create a uh, refinement backlog template for So I know my prompts are not that great, but I'm trying to see if I can. So Jetta.ei is another one, Spinach.io. So while that's waiting, I'll go to the next one. Uh, and this is the one that we built and we're still in beta. So it, this I, I'm more than happy to give uh, to anyone. But um, here, what we're trying to do is being able to talk to different roles. So I might have, uh, you know, agile coach where you are, maybe you're facing certain issues. So you can, uh, you know, ask saying that um, I have a team that is not great at, uh, let's say, at speaking up during retrospectives, um, suggest ways to engage. So here you can talk to the Agile coach, but you can also then talk to uh, 
you can bring in a different uh, you know character. So you can in, within the same conversation, uh, you can bring in another expert. Um, so we, we're we're still in beta. We're still working, get, trying to get feedback on what would be helpful for us as agilists uh, to be. And the key thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to include all the models in one place. So you'll have, this is Claude, you'll have all Gemini's being added this week. So, you know, everything is in one, one spot. But now that I have this, it says, okay, well, you can do a round robin. So everyone speaks using an anonymous survey before the retro to gather feedback, using engaging icebreaker activity. So you get, you get assistance really quickly. Uh, but now let's say I'm a product owner and this is part of my agile transformation team. I can say, hi, product owner. Uh, can you help me create stories uh, for implementing the above? So, here, so as a product owner, I want to have a set of icebreaker questions prepared ahead of time for the retro. So again, I could have given it more uh examples but as a scrum master i want to structure the discussion using techniques like so again it just took the context that we gave it above and, and started processing its expertise in that way so uh so many use cases here's another refinement backlog template item description on acceptance criteria tasks i know many people spend so much time trying to create the the design but this is really plug and chug right i have this boom done I can then collaborate with whoever I need, and we can we can move forward. Um, but you know, tools are getting better. Um, you know, spend some time. If you don't get the answer the first the first time, try again. Most likely, the time the, the what's happening that I'm observing is people will give it a shot once or twice, and then it's done. So, and these models are improving over time. It's not like they're staying in that zone. So it's really important that you um, you know keep trying. And, and keep going. Um, but uh, yeah, that brings me to the end. Um, sorry, I, I don't have enough time usually um, to go over everything. I think I went through a lot. Uh, but if you guys have any questions, you're always more than happy to connect with, with myself. Uh, uh, but here's a Q&A. If you guys can still see my screen, we can go straight to Q&A. So if you, slide that, if you scan that QR code, you can ask, ask away. So Chris, how did I do? Sorry, it's just I know it's just so much to cover. Didn't, didn't uh, and my slides were kind of out of order. So apologize lots for that. Of, lots of information. You've actually got me. I was uh, distracted creating an account with Jedda. So I wanted to see what I could do with it. I've not come across that one. Yeah, let me know if uh, anyone needs access to Jedda.ai as well. I can uh, probably probably see if I can provide discount code. Yeah, how can I keep employment with all of these AI tools? Uh, great question. Um, yes, Cursor is great. Uh, it is the first, actually, Cursor is the first, I think, IDE uh, that uh, uses AI. Um, uh, if, if you use it, you'll need an open AI key. Uh, but um, I, 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 I use it as well. I have Cursor. I would say also explore GitHub Copilot if your team has the ability to that cost. But I'm going to answer this first question. How can I keep employment with all these AI tools? Uh, so I'm working on an open source. I like to be the hugging face of Agile AI. Um, so here's something that I'm sharing. Sneak peek preview. No one's seen this. Uh, this is just uh, you guys are seeing it for the first time. Uh, what I'm putting here is an AI Agile framework, uh, first one. Uh, and this is based off of what we're doing in the work that we're doing in a lot, a lot of the enterprise companies that we're working with. Um, one is building the strategy, right? Uh, understanding vision, strategy, ethical guidelines, uh, and then taking action. And I think this is where AI Agile coaches would stand. You will still have an AI integration specialist and you'll have an AI data strategist. Uh, these three people will work very closely uh, to really promote a continual learning culture, a collaborative mindset, innovation orientation, ethical responsibility. So that's basically setting the stage. So, a, you get ready for it. We set that for our executives and you know the 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 innovation lab, whoever's heading that. And then the execution is 
where we have the AI product owner, DevOps engineers. And notice how I put these little two blue icons. If you see the blue icons, I think uh, agents and co-pilots can help. Where you don't see it is where humans are still needed uh, full time. Uh, so humans are needed everywhere in this, but it, it's the ones that have the blue that can be augmented uh, and, and you can focus on different things um, while that's there. So I'm more than happy. I'm about to release uh, the first version of this soon. Uh, we're still trying to kind of make some last minute changes um, on this uh, graphic here. Let me go back to my question. Any other questions? Do you mind if I jump in with a question? Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> so firstly, great presentation. Love what you did. Fantastic. Um, where can we get our hands on one, all of the slides, two, all of the resources that you've used, and that uh, AI uh, agile coach stuff that you're doing now? Yeah, so the AI agile coach stuff, um, there are many. So my background as a coach, uh, so I, I didn't uh, mention my background. So I come from a bioinformatics um, and uh, kind of machine learning, deep learning background. Um, before I became an Agile coach. So a lot of it's predicated on my experiences and um, kind of the engagements that I have. So we're trying to create this with uh, the intention of enterprise customers. And that's kind of where the AI Agile coach kind of initiated in, in you know, this was, I think, two and a half years ago, uh, you know, where, where this thought came in mind is that how can we embed these two things together? Uh, but more than happy to share kind of the resources that I pulled from uh, in terms of my thinking um, and and really putting that out there. So again, for me, I'm trying to open source everything uh, and trying to get collective feedback on how we can actually push the boundaries to reimagine agility in this new era. Uh, and we're doing that. I have, a, you know, I love to invite all of you guys to our meetup. Uh, yeah, I know some folks are here from that meetup. Um, and we have a meetup every two weeks where we're trying to just think of different things uh, and, and bring that to limelight. And I think um, for me, that is a mission that I'm on is, is how do we, um, you know, how do we keep pushing the boundaries? I sure, can I rephrase the question? Is it possible for you to put links possibly on the meetup discussion board that will allow us to go and mine all of these resources including yeah. in the discussion forums that you might have yeah absolutely uh, and one thing i will say to, if you want to get started right away deeplearning.ai it is the best number one free resource out there to learn ai like just if you just did everything on there a lot of people don't i mean it's free right now it's free the guy is going to start charging soon right so yeah, I I agree. Cassie Kozarov did um, did a series on YouTube as well, which is a hundred and some odd videos, which I also thought were really good. And uh, my inspiration comes from Cassie Kozarov, by the way. I, I my, had deep conversations, uh, story for another day, but she is a brilliant, brilliant person uh, when it comes to making things. Easy. She makes difficult things simple, which is a, a, a you know a skill all all in. All, basically all in, into its own. Just one thing that frustrates me a little bit um, and something I'm asking people to do, when you have conversations about AI, put a temporal dimension in the conversation. When people say that AI will not replace your job, that is, in my opinion, incorrect. If you say AI will not replace your job in the next five years, fair enough. If you say there's an 85% chance it won't be replaced within 10 years, fair enough. But the problem yeah. is that eventually all of our jobs have an overwhelming probability of becoming redundant because of AI, especially if we reach super AI. Yeah, absolutely. No, Mike, I think you, I think you make a valid point. And, uh, you know, I, I sometimes refrain because I think, again, that brings up that fear mongling aspect. So I try to balance it to say, you know, we, we shouldn't, my, my thinking is a little bit different in that aspect that yes, I think AI will take over many jobs not going to say it won't, it will take over many jobs, but there will be new things that emerge from, them, right? Uh, and like I just, uh, for example, I, I don't know if you saw in my diagram, I have a role of chief prompt engineer in that, right? 
it's a role that was nowhere to be found in the last two years. But uh, you know, we're, we're starting to hear that. And to me, a chief prompt, prompt engineer is very important, right? It's a new role, it's a new definition. And, and I think um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, and I think more roles like that will emerge. It might be called something different or it might twist a little bit, but in my, where I see things going, I feel like, you know, we might, yes, AI will be do, able to do many tasks. They, they will be able to do a lot of things, but we still will be able to do things that we haven't really actually come across just yet. Well, I'll certainly reach out to you because there's another conversation that's equally interesting to me. AGI plus robotics plus free energy gets rid of capitalism, but I'll have that conversation with you. I would love to connect, Mike. I love it. I love this. This is the energy I love. Even though I'm sick, I feel energized, which is great. So thanks for having me, Chris. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, I'm going to enable the reactions, folks. So feel free to jump on that soundboard and show some appreciation for the talk today. If you have the soundboard, you have the reactions. I'm feeling an air horn. Uh, Snail, you and I can catch up outside this and you can send over those links and I'll pass them on to everyone. Sure, absolutely. So Agile GPT and the, the meetup you've got and otherwise. Final thing, folks, before I let you disappear for the evening. So our next four meetups, next week we have a couple of, well, next week we've got a session with Nina and Yaka on new ways of working in progressive organizations. So not necessarily not transformation, not necessarily agile, but new ways of working. We've got Shipra on the 27th, facilitating product decisions. We have Michael Lloyd on dysfunction mapping in March, and then Martin Dalmin joins us on humble planning. So there's some great guests coming up you can jump on to Meetup and sign up for those sessions. Again, a lot of our noise, I'm just going to mute again, but otherwise, thank you for everyone today. The, the session will be on, uh, put on YouTube afterwards for anyone who missed it. So if you know someone that wanted to attend but couldn't, then they can catch up there. As you leave Butter, you'll be prompted to provide feedback. It's always helpful when a, when a, a guest speaker is, it gets a lot of the feedback how the session was. So do take a moment to provide that for Snail and I can pass that on to him. And thanks again. We'll see you next time, gang. Yeah.